We're going to be continuing our study through Acts called Acting Out. And so you're going to be wanting three areas of Scripture today. Acts chapter 13, Ephesians chapter 1, and John 6. Now, if you don't have a Bible, there's a one in the seat back pocket in front of you. And I'll give you the, uh, you're going to want to follow along today. Uh, once again, Acts 13, Ephesians 1, John chapter 6. Uh, we want to welcome you guys, even uh, everyone that is here in the auditorium, as well as those that are watching online. Grateful to be able to be a part of Coast Hills Church this morning. Now, I need to let you know, do you remember when we were in elementary school and you'd come and your teacher would start math class and she would say, um, let's put our thinking caps on, okay? So what I want you to do today is move away from your, um, uh, I need to be motivated, inspired kind of today to my academic doctrinal kind of hat kind of day. And we're going to walk through some truths found in Scripture that will inspire you and that will uh, be applicable to your life, but you're going to need to put on your thinking cap today uh, in order to follow along. And so we're going to pick up in Acts chapter 13. Why don't we go to the Lord in prayer uh, before we continue so that he can prepare our hearts for what our ears need to hear. Let's pray. Savior, I'm so thankful that uh, we have you to ask to give us spiritual ears to hear. And my prayer is, is as we go through the word of God, that you'll speak to us today in such a way that we will trust in your sovereignty and recognize our responsibility. Grant us the grace today, Lord, to be able to hear your word and then to apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's do a little bit of review. Paul started his first missionary journey, and he has found himself at Antioch, Pisidia. Now, this is on the Asian peninsula. This is not the Antioch in Syria. He has crossed the Mediterranean Sea, and as his usual practice, he goes into a synagogue because he really believed in giving to the gospel to the Jew first. And so he goes in and uses Jewish history to be able to lead them to the truth that the Jews have always been looking for a savior, whether it was a judge or a king. And with that history, he introduces them to Jesus and then warns them, don't neglect or reject the forgiveness that's found in Jesus. So with that backdrop, let's pick it up in Acts chapter 13, verse 42. So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Now when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. And I love this about those that were hungering for the word. They didn't just come to Sunday. Oh, no, no, no. They were at Daniel on Sunday night. They listened to Wednesday night. They were hungering for God's word. They're part of a life group, and they're walking through uh, God's word in their life group. They were not just weekly goers. They are so hungry, they follow Paul and Barnabas so they, they can learn throughout the week. And take a look at verse 44 on the next Sabbath. Almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Their home Bible study had grown so much that the whole city wanted to hear what Paul had to say. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. Now I want you to note they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit. So what they did, filled with envy, they were contradicting and blaspheming. They opposed the things spoken by Paul. They were not very happy about the fact that Jesus was Paul's offer. Then Paul and Barnabas grew bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should be spoken to you first. But since you, would you circle that word? But since you reject it, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, and now he pulls a verse from the Old Testament, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be for the salvation to the ends of the earth. 
And I ask you to circle that word you right there in verse 44 because I want you to understand Luke is introducing us to the doctrine of man's responsibility. You rejected, you had a choice, and you chose not to choose Jesus as your Savior and Lord. Paul looked at that, and having his devotions one day, he's there reading uh, in verse 47, I have set you as a light to the Gentiles, and there he was discovering from Isaiah as he's having his devotions one day, oh, that's me. I'm supposed to be the one that goes to the Gentiles, much like you'll have your devotions and the Lord will speak to you and you'll know how to direct your life. Paul's having his devotions, he reads from Isaiah, and he knows I'm called to go to the Gentiles. Picking it up, verse 45, now when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord, and as many had been appointed, I want you to circle that word, to eternal life believed, appointed. I ask you to circle that word because what Luke is doing, he's introducing the doctrine of God's sovereignty. We've been appointed. Now, hold on for that thought. Look at verse 49, and the word of the Lord was being spread throughout all the regions. So other people were getting saved. It was just in that moment that those who were being saved as well, these as well are appointed. But the Jews stirred up the devout men and prominent women and the chief men of the city, raised up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and expelled them from their region. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and came to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. I love this about Paul. He found his joy in preaching the gospel. He was filled, he was fulfilled preaching the gospel and making disciples. But I understand this get out of town mentality. I'll never forget, we were on our way to a village in Liberia, me and a friend of mine. And as we were on our way on this little teeny African path, these two women come running down the path looking frantic. And they're saying in in dialect, rebels are on the road. Well, I mean, looking like what they looked like and running as fast as they ran, you know what I did. I turned and I figured, well, if I run faster than them, maybe the rebels will get them first, right? I mean, I'm hoping that was not in my mind, but I sure did beat them to the road. I was being expelled out of one town and I was being sent to another. And I love the fact that Paul didn't get discouraged. He just went to the next town. He just did what God was calling him to do. But I love what Luke is letting us know. You see, in verse 46, he's letting us know you reject it. He's introducing us to the doctrine of human responsibility. But in verse 48, he also introduces us to God's sovereignty. We've been appointed. You see, this word tazo, it's a Greek word. It means to ordain, to place to set in motion. And with this word, what Luke is doing, he's introducing us to the doctrine of predestination and the doctrine of election, that we are the chosen of God. In fact, Ephesians chapter one, verse four, we've been chosen since the foundation of the world. Now you may ask yourself, wait a second. There seems a little tension between me having a choice and God being in absolute control, God being sovereign. Well, there is no tension. And there's also no inspired explanation in the Bible. The bottom line is, the Bible simply presents two truths. God is sovereign and man is responsible. Humanity is responsible. And so we've gotta be careful that we don't overemphasize one of God's truth without balancing it with the other of God's truth. And that's my hope today, that we can engage in a conversation or a monologue to be able to express the two incredible truths of God. He is sovereign, he's in absolute control of everything, and you're responsible for, every, for the decision you make in regard to salvation. Now, there's two things we need to get before we even go further into this, and here's what's gonna happen. I've got over 25 verses that we're gonna be looking at, but I've helped you out. I'm gonna be providing my notes for you in the Sela email that comes out, and I've got all the verses on the screen. 
So let's take a look at the first one, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 9. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, it's an effort in futility to think you can figure out God. And he makes us know, I am higher than you. My thoughts are more than you. It's an effort in futility to try to figure out everything about God. That's the first thing I want us to know walking into this. Secondly, Paul lets us know we only know God in part. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 9. We only know a part of God. Do you guys know God's eternal? Like there are so many parts of God that we don't know. So as we walk into this conversation, I'm asking you to become comfortable with uncomfortable. You know this feeling. You remember algebra? Ninth grade, eighth grade, whenever you took it. Do you remember when your teacher put up there like all the X's and Y's and you're like, where are the numbers? Like, where's two plus two? Where, like what and the, why are, why is a letter involved with a number? Like what is going on here? Now just imagine if your algebra teacher only knew arithmetic. So they're trying to explain algebra to you, but they only know two plus two. And you actually know division, but they don't know division. They only know addition. Now you know more than them. What in the world are you doing sitting in their class? You see, I am grateful that God knows more than me. That makes him God to me. You see, I can believe a God who knows more than me because then I can trust in the fact that he is sovereign and I can praise him because I can't figure him out. So with those two precepts, let's walk into this. Truth number one, write it down. God is sovereign. He is in absolute control of everything. Every decision, every action, and every possibility. There is no chance with God. Listen, 1 Chronicles chapter 16, David writing of God, let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. His sovereignty should not freak us out. His sovereignty should make us rejoice. He's in absolute control. He's in control of my life. David goes on to say, Psalm 135, verse six, whatever the Lord pleases, he does. In heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all the deep places, the Lord is able and will do whatever he pleases. That's why Paul wrote Romans 9. Romans 9 is not the forbidden chapter of scripture, Romans 9 expresses the sovereignty of God. He chose Abraham. You didn't have a problem with that. He chose Moses over Pharaoh. You didn't have a problem with that. He chose Jacob over Esau. You didn't have a problem with that. But now that he's chosen the Gentiles, you got a problem. So Paul writes and says, I need to let you know something. He's sovereign. He's not too concerned about what you think of how he should operate. He's in absolute control. Look at Proverbs 16, So much control that the lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Every decision? There's not a decision that's made that he's not made? He's sovereign. He's in absolute control. This is why Jesus could tell the disciples, uh, don't worry about tomorrow. Uh, he's able to tell them, don't worry about tomorrow because God's got it. He's already got a plan. He's got your future. He knows what's gonna happen. So what are you worrying for? Don't worry about tomorrow, Jesus says, because God's in absolute control. He's got every detail figured out and he lets us know that. Listen to what Isaiah tells Hezekiah, 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 25. Did you not hear long ago how I made it? From ancient times that I formed it? Now, I have brought it to pass. God's got a plan. And God's acting in his plan, and he's making his plan happen. That's why in Romans chapter 12, when Paul is talking about God's plan, he says God's plan is good, pleasing, and perfect. There's absolutely nothing wrong with God's plan. And it's perfect because of the essence of God's sovereignty. He's in control. 
And I want to describe to you what is the essence of his sovereignty. Where does this perfection come from? Well, it's found in three things. The first is his omniscience. God is all-knowing. It's Psalm chapter 147, verse 5. Great is our Lord, mighty in power. His understanding is infinite. In other words, there's nothing that could surprise him. He knows everything that there is to know. So much so, listen to this. David writes in Psalm 139, O Lord, you've searched me and known me. You know my sitting down, my rising up. You understand my thoughts afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways, for there is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. I love this about God. He knows everything I'm going to say. He knows every move I'm going to make. There's no surprise that comes out of my mouth because the beauty of this is I can't disappoint God. He doesn't go into the heavens and go, oh my goodness, I can't believe what Chet said. He knows what I'm going to say and he's already acted in forgiveness. All I have to do is confess. I love this about his omniscience. Here's what else I love. Listen, Matthew chapter 10, verse 30. But the very heads of your head, very hairs of your head are all numbered. Even the ones that fell out last night. He knows. He knows minus three. Maybe minus 10. I don't know. But here's the deal. He knows the number of hairs. On, he knows you so intricately. He knows you so well. He's actually counted. Okay? No, he hasn't counted. He knows he just knows. He knows the number of hair. That's how omniscient he is. Listen to this. It's, Mark, it's Psalm 44, 21. Would not God search this out? For he knows the secrets of his heart. I don't know what you're thinking about my sermon, but Jesus does. <laughs> he knows your secrets. He knows what you're thinking. It's why in Mark 12, we read throughout the Gospels, Jesus knew their hearts. He knew their hearts. It's why we read he perceived what they were thinking. No one had to tell him. John watched Jesus' ministry life for three years. And to write about Jesus, he says this in John chapter 2. John chapter 2, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. He had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. He knows everything about us, even the number of hair on our head. Nothing surprises him. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. Secondly, his essence of sovereignty is found in his omnipotence. Omnipotence, big word, God is all-powerful. He has the power not only to make a plan, but he's got the power to put every detail of his plan into action. Listen to what God says of himself. It's Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9. Isaiah 46. Remember the former things of old? For I'm God. There is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. And excuse me, I don't know if God would say it as sarcastically as I am, but I, I got to imagine he's in the heavens going, are you really trying to think you're sovereign and can figure me out? for I'm God. Verse 10, declaring the end from the beginning, I got a plan. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. He's got the power to do what he said he's going to do. Let me give an example. So the angel shows up. There's Mary, little teenage girl, and says to Mary, you are going to have a child. Mary goes, uh, we got a problem. <laughs> I'm not married. I'm a virgin. I'm not sure how this whole thing is going to happen. Like, you know, and Mary goes, how can this be? And the angel responds in Luke chapter one and says this, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Mary, I told Isaiah the plan hundreds of years prior to this, that a virgin would give birth to a child. And I gave the plan because I'm omniscient but I'm omnipotent. I'm all powerful. I can make the plan happen. Nothing's impossible with God. Everything is possible. The church finally gets this, that he's all powerful. 
It's in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, church has been raptured. We are glorified. So now we know the truth. And there we are in heaven, and we're worshiping God. And this is what we say about him. Revelation 4, 11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. The glorified church who now knows, they look at God and go, wow, you are all powerful. You are omnipotent. You're the almighty God. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's eternal. The essence of his sovereignty and the reason the plan is so perfect, he's eternal. Listen to what Paul wrote Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God alone who is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you hear how he's described? The king eternal. He's existed always. He never not was. It's why he can offer eternal life, because he is eternal life. Now, there's our problem. Our problem is the fact that we exist, we exist in a thing called time. But I want to remind you, God created time. It's why Jesus said, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I created time. I created the beginning and I created the ending, but I'm on eternity on either side. Our problem, we're not eternal. Let me give an example of this. Do you remember the book of Revelation? Revelation hasn't happened yet. It was given 2,000 years ago. Are you amazed that John 2,000 years ago would write, and the whole world saw the two witnesses die? How in the world did John know about CNN 2,000 years ago? John is trying his hardest to write down what he's experiencing because God is living his present future in John's past. Because God doesn't live in time. He created time. That's why John could write, listen, and I saw. He was living in God's future. Because God doesn't live in time. He is eternal. Now, it's why it's difficult to understand these concepts because we have no concept of eternality. Now, for me, your ways are higher. Oh, I will worship you, Lord. You're my God. You got your algebra down, and I'm going to sit in your class because I know I can trust you because you know your stuff. Because he's eternal, he's never learned. He's always known. He's never learned. He's never come to an understanding. And that's why Luke would write, very confident in God's sovereignty, that God is in absolute control, that as many had been appointed to eternal life, believed. Luke tells us, in God's sovereignty, we've been appointed. Now, Paul explains this. Remember, Luke and Paul were companions, so Luke is very confident because Paul is very confident in God's sovereignty. Would you look? It's Romans 8, 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. Now, take a look at the sovereignty of God. He foreknew. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Predestination and election are eternal concepts because they're connected to the sovereignty of God. He never not knew. Once again, predestination and election are con eternal concepts because they're connected to the eternality, to the sovereignty of God. God foreknew he also predestined. It's, uh, remember, go back to Ephesians, chosen since the foundation of the world. He's always known. He's never not known. He never learned that we would be saved. He always knew that we would be. It's why Jesus, in Mark chapter 12, could know their thoughts. Gang, he didn't come to understand their thoughts in that moment. 
He knew their thoughts for eternity. That's why John could say no one had any need to tell anyone to Jesus of what anyone was thinking. Jesus knew what was in man. He knew it because he's God from eternity. And so the plan is in action. He's able to perceive what they're thinking because he's always known, always known. Um, Go with me to John chapter six. I ask you to keep your finger there. John chapter six, we're gonna go, uh, John chapter six, verse 64. Let me illustrate this for you. John chapter six, verse 64. But there are some of you who do not believe. We'll get to that in a moment. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. The Bible says he knew from the beginning. He knew from the beginning. He always knew. There was never a time when he didn't know. He always knew. He never had a time when he came to know those who would be saved. He always knew. Now, because he always knew, he's able to save because he's omnipotent. He's omniscient, he always knew. He's omnipotent, he's able to save. His plan is gonna be fulfilled in our lives. And you might go, wait a second. Why is all this important for the fact that God is sovereign and he's involved with every decision? Now go with me to Ephesians, you'll see. Ephesians chapter one, Ephesians chapter one, let's take a look at the point of God's sovereignty. Ephesians chapter one, look at verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now here's the blessing. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. So that's a choice having predestined us to adoptions as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. See, what Paul is letting us know, it's very important that we understand that God is sovereign, that God is in absolute control, that God is involved with every decision because he's the only one qualified to determine what gives him glory. So let's say you had a bad day and you come in and you're just a little grumpy. Well, I don't want to be kind. God don't care. God says, be kind. That glorifies me. Well, I don't feel like being kind right now. God, he's not wrestling with you. He's not like up in heaven going, okay, you had a bad day. I get it. No, he's sovereign. His plan is that we are kind. So if you come in with a grumpy attitude, You better change your attitude if you want to glorify God because he's determined the way to glorify him is that you are kind. Now, let's say you're a mean husband. Guess what? You're wrong. Well, you don't know what my wife is like. Well, guess what? You don't know what you're like. And as God is looking at the two of you, he says, listen, husbands, love your wives. You ain't got a choice. That's how I'm glorified. And wives, love your husbands. I don't care what you think about it. I mean, respect your husbands. That's what glorifies me. I don't care about the women's lib movement and the leadership in both 50-50%. The man is the leader of a home. You don't like it? Guess what? I don't care. I'm God. That's the way that I planned it. Now, you may wrestle with it, but God ain't. He knows how to give himself glory. And what I love about his sovereignty is the second truth is so important because it's part of his sovereignty. It's what he chose. Number two, write it down. Human beings are responsible. We're responsible. We are not pre-programmed robots for either salvation or damnation. Let me prove it to you. Jesus himself, it's Matthew's gospel. Matthew's gospel, I'm gonna pick it up. Matthew's gospel, chapter 22, 23. It'll be on the screen. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. I wanted to, but you didn't. Man is responsible for the decisions that you make. In fact, every command of God in Scripture is proof of the reality of human responsibility. 
So in Romans chapter 9, we read God's sovereign. He makes every decision. He chooses. There's a predestination. There's an election. God is sovereign. But in Romans chapter 10, we read, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So Romans 9, he proves that God can make whatever decision he wants. Romans 10, he says, man's responsible for the decision that we make. This goes all the way back to the garden. You remember, God tells Adam, I put a tree there. Don't eat. You shall not eat. He gave him a choice. Because remember, we've been predestined for him in love. We've been chosen in love. And love's a choice. So he gave Adam a choice. And he purposely put that tree to give him the choice. Because forced love is rape. So if God forced us to love him, that wouldn't be real love. Love's a choice. So he gives Adam a choice. And Adam ate the apple. Don't email me. I don't know if it was an apple. It was probably passion fruit, okay? Maybe star fruit. I don't know. He ate the fruit. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, God shows up and he says this, because you have, you're accountable. You're accountable for the decision that you made. Jesus would repeat these words in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, verse 48, he would say, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them at the last day. You are responsible. Jesus reiterates the truth. But all of our choices are his eternal plan. And he uses them for his good. Did you hear that? All of our choices are, are his eternal plan, and he uses them for good. Now, let me explain it like this. You remember Joseph? Joseph had some brothers. They sold him into slavery. Now, I don't know the issues you got with your siblings, but I doubt any one of us would sell our brother or our sister. Well, some of you are thinking you probably would. Stop. That is sinful. And remember, God knows the secret of your heart, okay? So listen. Some of us, we would probably never sell our siblings like to like the Saudi Arabian slave trade. Now, I don't know if Saudis have slave trades, but I'm just saying, none of us would do it. His brothers did it. They sold him to Egypt. They wanted to make money off their brother. Joseph goes there. He's there for years. He's a slave. Then he's in jail. But all the while, God is working his sovereign plan just to save the brothers. So the brothers need food. They come to Joseph, who's now Mr. Man in Egypt, and Joseph saves his whole family. Problem, Jacob dies. Daddy. So the brothers go to Joseph. Dude, we know Jacob's dead. Like, don't kill us, please. Like, I mean, come on. And Joseph responds to his brothers and says this. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about, as it is this day, to save many people alive. Joseph explains something that describes the problem of evil. Man, you brought evil into this world with your choice. But God knew it. It wasn't like he was up in heaven going, oh my goodness, uh, Gabriel, what do you think we should do? Um, Jesus, Holy Spirit, like, we got a caucus. We got to understand, like, Adam just sinned. We didn't plan on that. Like, what in the world are we going to do? No, no, no. Adam brought sin into the world. God had a plan to use it for good, to bring about redemption. The plan was always redemption because in Revelation chapter 13, verse eight, the Bible says that Jesus was slain since the foundation of the world. His plan was always to redeem what man messed up. He's eternal. He knew the choices and was heavily engaged and involved. Now, this is why Jesus makes the call to everyone. Because when Adam sinned, everyone entered into sin. We're all born into sin. And because God is just, he offers salvation to everyone 
under the curse. So he can legitimately say in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. He didn't say the elect. He didn't say the chosen. He didn't say those predestined. He said, come to me all. Listen to the plea in Revelation 22. And the spirit and the bride say, come. It's up to us to evangelize. And the spirit, we're the bride, we're the church. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take from the water of life freely. Anyone can come. Whosoever can come. He's opened the door to all because all were opened to sin. He's a just God. And his desire, oh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, God desires all men to be saved. I got a question for you. How many of you are thankful that Jesus didn't come back five years ago? Anyone? Great. How many of you are thankful Jesus didn't come back 10 years ago? Okay, 20 years ago. How many of you glad Jesus didn't come back 20 years ago? Great. How many of you are glad Jesus didn't come back 30 years ago? Okay, great. How many of you are glad Jesus didn't come back 40 years ago? Great. Now, if I keep going, people are going to raise their hand. They're going to be like embarrassed. So I'm going to stop there, okay, because we all think you're under 50, okay? Now, listen, the point is, how glad are you that God has long suffered with sin to wait for you to get saved. Listen to this. Peter wrote it. This is the Peter who always put his foot in his mouth. This is the Peter who Jesus said, you faithless pervert. That's what he said to him. You faithless and perverse generation. Jesus didn't mince meat with his disciples, okay? This is Peter who he said, how long must I bear with you? That wasn't a question. That was a statement. I'm going to bear with you as long as it takes. And Peter got it. And he writes this in 2 Peter chapter 3. Look, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he's long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He's not willing for anyone to go to hell. His heart and desire is that everyone gets saved. And he's long-suffering. Do you remember Paul? Paul meets Jesus in the roads of Damascus. Remember what Jesus said? How long will you kick against the goats? Do you know what he was saying? I've suffered with you a long time. You've murdered my people. You have, cha- you have beat them. You have jailed them. And I've used my people to give the gospel to you for years and you've rejected me. How long will you continue to kick against the goads? So since you can't get it from my people, here I am. I'm here to tell you I'm Jesus. I'm the one you're persecuting. Oh, the great grace of God to long suffer with Paul because he loves him. But Paul had to make a choice. Would he look at Jesus that moment and walk away just like Jerusalem did and they rejected him? No, he chose to receive, not reject. You see, human responsibility exalts God's sovereignty because that's what he chose as part of the plan. So when we make the decision to follow after God, it's part of the plan. Now, some of you are going, wait a second. How do I reconcile these? God is sovereign, so he's in control of every decision. He knows everything I'm going to say, everything I'm going to do, and I'm responsible. I mean, wasn't Judas called the son of perdition? Shouldn't he be able to stand in front of Jesus and say, listen, this is your fault. You chose me to be the son of perdition, so you can't send me to hell. Blame is the second sin of the Bible. The wife you gave me did it. Second sin of the Bible. We always want to blame God because we want to reject his control over our lives. It's been since time began. Remember Psalm chapter two. God looks at the nations and he goes, why do you rage against me in vain? He says, I live in heaven and I laugh at you. Ha, 
I love, God laughs at the nations who are balking at his sovereignty. They're making this plan. They're going to come against God. And God goes, <laughs> that's funny. You think you're sovereign. Wait till I show up. I mean, just imagine heaven roaring in laughter because we struggle with the sovereignty of God. But how do we reconcile these two truths? Because they're true. God is sovereign in absolute control and man is responsible. Got great news for us. We don't have to. We don't have to reconcile them because they're already reconciled in heaven. Well, wait a second, I don't understand. Got a verse for you. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, his sovereignty and your responsibility, and he'll get you there. He'll make you pass straight. You see, the point is he's God. That's why he directs us in the things that we don't understand to trust him in what he presents to us as truth. But Acts 13 is not the only place this truth is presented. God graciously gives us many more examples of this in scripture. I want to point out two for you. Go back with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, I want you to see this. John chapter 6, verse 37 all that the Father gives me will come to me. There's God's sovereignty, John 6, 37. And the one who comes to me, I'll by no means cast out. There's man's responsibility. Look at verse 40, man's responsibility. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him, everyone who sees the Son and believes in him, may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Man's responsibility. You're presented with the gospel. You have your choice. Take a look at God's sovereignty. Verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. God's sovereignty. But John wonderfully helps us understand how the Father draws. It's a beautiful picture. In John chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus says this. If I am lifted up, God eternal, God omnipotent, God omniscient says, if I am lifted up, if I'm put on the cross, I will draw all men to myself. That's why Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God. The cross is the power that draws people to Christ. God is sovereign and man is responsible. Look at Philippians chapter two, it'll be on the screen, I'll read it. Therefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, listen carefully, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's up to you to make the decision to receive or reject. Now look at God's sovereignty, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God has no issue with his absolute control and giving you a free will to make a decision. No issue at all. It's reconciled in heaven. And there's something you can trust about God and it's where I close. It's Psalm chapter 145, verse seven. The Lord is just in all his actions and exhibits love in all he does. He's just. No one goes to hell who doesn't deserve it. He's just. No one goes to hell. No one can stand before the seat and say, you chose me to go to hell. He's just. But he's also, the Bible says, exhibits love in all he does. There's no part of his plan that doesn't exhibit love. That's why he draws with the cross. It's the exhibition of his love. Now, what do I do with this? All right, Chet. Thank you, all those verses, that's great. And I'll walk out of here and I'll remember two things. God's sovereign, man's responsible. I won't remember John 12, I won't remember John 6, but I'll remember God's sovereign, man's responsible. So what do I do with this? 
Well, if you really believe that God is sovereign, what do you worry for? Like, why are so many people on Prozac? When Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow, it has enough worries of its own. And when Jesus said, do not worry, and then we worry, it's actually called sin. So what are we worried about? He's sovereign. He's in absolute control. He's involved with every decision. He's guarding and guiding your life. Secondly, man's responsible. How can they believe unless they hear? We're responsible to preach the gospel. Charles Spurgeon, he says it best. Listen to what he says. He said, when you know the fish are biting, you go fishing. If we know there's predestination, election, and there are people that are chosen, written in the Lamb's book of life, go fishing. People are going to get saved. It may not be everybody, but someone's going to get saved because he says there are fish. So I'm going to make you fishers of men. Go fishing. You're responsible to preach the gospel to either receive as well to reject. But gang, you're also responsible to make disciples. Because if you're unkind... And God says what glorifies me is kindness. You better change because his whole plan is about giving him glory, not you.